Hi, this is Arthur. You're listening to To Let's Talk in Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. Today's guest is Sarah Tamale. Everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dumbcast family of podcasts, and I am thrilled today to be joined by Soraya Chamali, who is the author of many things, including Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger, which is a topic near and dear to my heart at the moment. Uh, so hello, Soraya. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, I'm so excited to be talking to you. I think there's a lot of things <laughs> that we could talk about at the moment. Maybe you could start by just telling me a little bit about how you got interested in the the idea of writing about anger and, and rage and, and how that relates to gender. Sure. Uh, actually, the, there was quite a specific catalyst, which was our last election. It was pretty clear that uh, there was a lot of anger in the air, but as candidates in particular showed, some people's anger was more acceptable than other people's anger. So you could see Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump dumping their podiums and looking right in the face. And because the display of their anger confirmed our ideas about masculinity and leadership and even the presidency, they could leverage populist anger and voter rage, whereas women candidates can't do that. And Hillary Clinton certainly couldn't do that. She had to stay very calm and composed and was often called inauthentic or not charismatic as a result of that kind of distancing from emotion. And so even as a writer, I knew how important emotion was, but how difficult it is to navigate in public space. So I wanted to look at how it affected us personally, politically, and professionally, which is what I tried to do in the book. So I love this book. (laughs) It's amazing. Oh, thank you. I found it really uh, resonated with me in a lot of places. Uh, But I want to talk some about this idea of candidates, because you you mentioned uh, in the book, when you're talking about that dynamic of Hillary Clinton not being able to show the anger, you point out that at the time, Elizabeth Warren was doing a lot of rage tweeting and was showing anger. Yeah. Do you think that as a candidate, Warren uh, and, and the other women, since we have a variety of women running this year, are showing more of that anger? Is is the dynamic a little bit different this time around? I think it is different. I mean, what I wrote about in the book was that Warren was really kind of tweeting as a proxy for Clinton often. She could respond, and this is, I think, quite typical in our way of dealing with women's anger, because she was often perceived as responding for someone else, so extending her care or empathy, her anger didn't seem so much to be about her or her needs, but about another person or another community's needs. It was more palatable, you know, and so that's a really common dynamic in terms of gender and anger because women are expected to be nurturers. They're expected to be selfless and sacrificial. And so if we get angry in those roles as mothers or teachers, or um, in that case, as a political proxy for someone who wasn't free to do it, it's more understandable. But if we get angry on our own behalf, if we put a stake in the ground and, and we really talk about our own needs and our own demands and our own rights, it's not as welcome by the society. But I do think that, to your point about a change, that the, the reins on that have really loosened, which is also something we see in times of political tumult throughout history. You know, in, in really difficult, fraught political times, there's more socially a way for women to be public and political and activist and loud. Uh, but then there's all, always a kind of cyclical response to their having to go back into their traditional spaces and modes of behavior. Yeah, I, I feel like, and I don't know if this is going to die out once the current political moment is is over or if it's going to sustain. But it feels uh, to me like more women that I know, not just political women, but sort of women everywhere are sort of allowing themselves to uh, to show that emotion, to show anger, to to be more demanding in general. And I, 
it feels like a lot of it comes from the Women's March, from seeing this collective of so many people coming together that I'm not the only one that feels this way and that look what we can achieve if we all come together. And do you think that there is a potential for that to continue, assuming we ever get back to normal political times in this country, which open question, you know, that that we have the potential to sort of keep going and move forward away from the way things have been structured in the past? So I am maybe a little more cautious and cynical. You know, the women's movement, the women's march was so important. It was globally the largest ever public demonstration in at least recorded history, right? And it showed the ways in which women could organize in solidarity and peacefulness. But before the Women's March, of course, there were things like Black Lives Matters protests. And, you know, those were also organic and networked and uh, also then took on global meaning. But they didn't Result, for example, in the United States in a lot of white women mobilizing in support of the black queer women who organized those movements. And I think it really begs the question of what it will take to honestly and openly address those historic racial divisions and, and have sort of common values and goals in terms of idealized democracy. I mean, right now, globally, there is a an anti-rape protest movement uh, that it involves, for example, a, a dance that it started in Chile uh, and women all over the world are doing it. And it's an example to me of how women can come together across difference to address something they share, which is the experience of universal male predation, you know? And, and so I think those are two different models for what communal anger born action can look like. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, of course, we run the risk always of when lives become comfortable again for a right. segment of population that, that they will no longer be agitated and, and no longer working toward change, despite the fact that lives will still not be comfortable for many, many people. Right. And, and I think that's, that's the issue of privilege and status and entitlement and, you know, who gets to define what a real problem is. So I wanted to, to talk some, too, about motherhood. So, uh, so much of your book, sort of, there are threads running through of, of mothers and daughters of, of pregnancy. And, you know, I, I thought a lot about the, the part of the book that resonated most with me was the chapter about uh, pregnancy. I remember being mm -hmm. so angry the whole time I was pregnant, right. especially with my second son. Uh, toward the end of my pregnancy, I actually started working from home, not because I was physically mm -hmm. un too uncomfortable to go into work, but because I just couldn't be around other people anymore. <laughs> right. And I, I can't imagine that you had twins. Uh, you know, that must have uh, been <laughs> even that much worse that, that people feel like they right. can uh, sort of uh, comment on you and say, say whatever you want, uh, objectify. They you. really do. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I, I wonder how we can think about modeling appropriate anger for our children, both for our sons and our daughters, uh, mm -hmm. and, and how, how important that role is in, you know, the looking at your, your mother as your model for what anger can and should look like and what healthy anger might look like. And, you know, you have some terrific examples, but I, I wonder, you know, sort of what you see is is that relationship sort of the the single defining thing about what you're going to do with your anger you know absent sort of reading uh, about what to do with your anger but you know uh, mm -hmm. just sort of naturally is that is that the relationship you see as really key to that yeah i mean i think that we don't generally think about or really even talk about the degree to which gender is the organizing principle of our lives, right? Like we have so many complex social dynamics related to class and race and disability. And, you know, we, we, we know what those look like in terms of our public interactions. Uh, and we're uh, hopefully, thankfully 
talking more honestly about them. But in fact, gender, which people I think tend to think of as the way we display femininity or masculinity or queerness, is also a structural prop, right? It's the scaffolding of how we attribute roles and responsibility and how we value or don't labor in society. And that begins the minute we're assigned a gender. And so we teach children largely how to behave and how to think about and deal with emotions in very gendered ways. So boys will very quickly understand that to show empathy or sadness or fear or vulnerability is feminizing and actually a degradation of masculinity, but that anger and displays of aggression are the path to quote unquote real manhood. And girls, on the other hand, learn really er early to subsume negative feelings like anger or behaviors that are aggressive in an effort to do what they're supposed to, which is put the needs of others first, make other people more comfortable, not be difficult or demanding. And so that doesn't really serve those children as individuals, um, either as children or adults. It doesn't really serve society very well because we, we, aren't, we don't have, lead healthy lives as a result. And so what I write about is how do we instead think in terms of emotional competence and what does it mean to model emotional competence? Because these are all human emotions and we all feel them and have the right to feel them. And we have the right to make demands on the world and our communities if they claim to care for us and love us. Um, so I, I really do think that as adults, and it's not just parents because there are so many influential adults, shifting from gender to competence can offset a lot of the learned behaviors that we have that can be so negative and destructive. Yeah, I think some about how my kids uh, are, are having this modeled for them, this uh, emotional competence. So, you know, I grew up in a, a household where you avoided confrontation at all costs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you just, that didn't right. happen. Uh, neither my mother nor my father uh, ever, you know, you never sent back food at a restaurant. Like there was just no confrontation. And my husband grew up in a, a very much the opposite kind of household. And so I think about, you know, sort of what what our kids are seeing uh, of our learned behaviors of what we're showing them, you know, but on the other hand, also, we we think about these things and, and we we try to model good behavior. Uh, I, so, you know, I just I, I wonder a lot about sort of what uh, what that will mean. And of course, I have boys who are uh, already usually uh, you know, socially allowed to give more expression of their anger. Uh, so I, I want to talk to you about uh, the Women's Media Center speech project uh, that you mm -hmm. work on, uh, this idea of uh, harassment of women online. Uh, it seems like the while there is a lot of, of great things that have come out of social media, which you talk to in your book, there's also, of course, this this really toxic culture. Uh, so I wonder the, the kinds of things that you are working on in that regard and the, the ways that you would like to see, you know, in, in whatever form it, it can and should be moderated to, to see those things put into place. So the speech project was really born out of necessity because, well, certainly in my own experience as a writer, as a journalist, and speaking publicly, there's a lot of hostility and a lot of violence and harassment. So, you know, I I resented the idea that as a function of doing my work, I just needed to get used to being sent um, violent pornography or rape threats or similar content. And there were just so many women I knew who were exhausted by this and who chose to stop speaking or writing. And that struck me as uh, really problematic. But media itself and the society itself was treating that treatment of women in much the same way that it treats tra traditionally treats violence against women, which is that the onus is on us to stay safe. And if that staying safe means that we don't go out at night or don't say certain things, or are polite in the face of threat, then that's just what we have to do. And in fact, it's a real issue of women's equality and dignity and ability to participate in civic and political life. And so we established the initiative 
to shed light on what this looks like and what it means and to help frame the conversation differently so that it becomes a priority in, in civil society to understand why women's freedom of speech is so important. I mean, a lot of the approaches to these threats is very paternalistic. It's, it's you know, stay, we, we're going to protect the girls and the women and, and you, you know, we're, we're going to make sure they stay out of harm's way. But that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about women's right to engage in public life. And we know that that's, that's being harmed. So a recent study conducted by the Committee to Protect Journalists of Women Journalists in the United States and Canada found that online threats and harassment are their, the number one concern for workplace viability, for safety, for tenure of women journalists. And and that, that similarly, women politicians are facing this immense tide of resistance. And so in the UK, for example, almost, I think, 20 MPs, women, recently stepped down citing that they'd had enough of the threats and the toxicity of trying to be public servants. Um, so we try and, you know, we, we try and raise awareness of those issues and, and also to advocate with tech companies and the legal community and, and legislators to focus on this. Do you have advice for women who are in, you know, besides the just stay away from, you know, the, the social media, like how how you and, and other women handle those kinds of things as they come to you, as you receive that kind of harassment? Yes. I mean, I, I think that everyone, regardless of their identity or a place in the world or job that they do, should really have just basically, you know, some basic digital security practices. So two-step verification, uh, tracking or monitoring your reputation, understanding that, you know, if, if, you, if you believe that you're in a situation that might result in harassment, which for women can mean an angry ex, you know, boyfriend or a stalker um, or an angry reader, for example. If you're in that sort of situation um, and you feel that there, there may be harm or threat, you should actually get to know your um, your local law enforcement officers and sort of explain to them what's happening. Uh, you should also, if you work at an institution, uh, work with that institution to make sure that they understand what's happening and that there are safeguards in place. So if you're a journalist or you're in the media world, um, it's often your work that's putting you in a, in a more vulnerable, high, highlighted position. And institutions need to have our backs. You know, if we're going to be doing this work and if this work puts us in the line of this kind of uh, danger, what in fact are institutions doing to secure us? And to make sure that they have a commitment to genuine inclusivity by supporting by supporting you. So it kind of runs the gamut. Are there things that you wanted to make sure that we talk about today? You know, I I think there are a couple of things. One is that you know there's no universal bucket of women for whom there's a one stereotype about anger or one policing strategy. It's you know it's very nuanced and the way anger is perceived or treated both internally and externally has a lot to do with context. Who are you talking to? Where is that conversation happening? But it's often the case that uh, a woman will impute her own experience to other women, which I think is unhelpful ultimately. So a black woman's experience of anger and how her, her anger is perceived or dealt with is very different from a white woman's, which is very different from a brown woman's, you know? And I think we need to be cognizant of the way our own behavior may contribute to the negative experiences of others in that regard. And to be particularly sensitive to those cross currents in children that we deal with, because we spend a lot of time now, if we do social justice work, trying to encourage people to interrogate lifelong lessons and to maybe overcome biases, but it would be a lot simpler if we didn't teach those lessons in the first place. <laughs> yeah. I 
would like to encourage everyone to uh, buy your book, of course, uh, Rage Becomes Her. Oh, thank you. <laughs> put a link up to that. Um, but also, I noted that on your website, you have the, the 10 steps to emotional competence and efficacy, yes. uh, which is a, sort of a, a condensed version of uh, what you lay out at the end of the mm-hmm. book. Uh, and so I really want to encourage everyone to look at that as well. I think it's helpful to me as I'm thinking about, you know, I it, it's really hard to think about how to be angry if you've been taught your whole life like not to show anger Uh, it's super hard (laughs) uh freeing of course (laughs) Mm -hmm. um but but yeah just thinking uh, it's such a uh, it's hard to think about that as something you have to learn um but clearly it is something that you have to learn and be very conscious of Uh, and so i think the steps are really helpful in in laying that out and in helping you sort of grapple with those issues well thank you i hope they are you know i think the hardest part actually is what I think of as practicing at home, if you cannot be honest about your needs and your feelings with the people who are closest to you, it's very hard to then be true to yourself when you go out into the world, you know, but sometimes those intimate relationships and conversations with parents or spouses or children are really the hardest, but once you do it, it's done, (laughs) you know, you have to kind of weather, if you anticipate a storm, you have to weather it, And then it's a matter of habit, you know, when you have to say the words, well, I'm angry or I need you to do X, you know, we're often taught as girls and women never to say those things, not to impose on people. And and that's bad. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah. A lifetime of things I need to unlearn. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Soraya, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, This is really great. And, you know, as the uh, presidential election goes forward and hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe we'll have a a woman nominee on the Democratic side. uh, You know, I think there'll be a lot of things uh, to be looking at in this regard, you know, and not just the presidential election, but all sorts of things going on in in politics that are women really rising to the to the fore and and being, uh, you know, needing to show uh, certain amounts of healthy anger. Yes, I agree. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really great to talk. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at twobroadstalkingpolitics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.